All right, please join me in prayer. Merciful and ever present God, we are grateful, we are so grateful for the ways that you have showed us to connect with one another in these times when we care for each other by staying socially distant. It's so strange and it's been such a strange several months and through it all, you have been present with us and you have helped us explore new ways to be your people, to be the body of Christ, new ways to be faithful. Lord, we don't want to forget these lessons. We don't want to forget what we have learned. We don't want to forget the people who have come alongside us while we've been digitally worshiping and gathering for study and prayer. So be with us now as we think and dream about what the church can look like as we move forward, what we can be as we are online and in person, how we can live more fully into your call to make disciples of all nations. So be with us in this time. Thank you for the experience that Bruce will share with us and also the questions that he will provoke in us and for us. Above all, help us be faithful and help us share your light and love everywhere we are, online, in person, every time. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So I am thrilled to turn this over to a friend and colleague, Bruce Reyes Chow, who is coming to us all the way from that far west coast in California. Bruce, it's good to see you. It's good to have you. Take it away. All right. All right. Well, good to be with you all. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so uh, thanks for having me. Uh, good afternoon for you all. It's uh, This is about as early as I'm willing to start for folks out here in California. So it is good to be with, be with you. Um, uh, to give you a sense of what we're going to do today, we're, we're going to um, go through a couple of sections. Uh, one is around just pastoral leadership in this time, because I think some of what we're going through these days are, are just around how do we lead in this in this time and acknowledging some of that. Then we're going to do a, a breakout group, a quick kind of conversation, and then we're going to talk about this hybrid new way of worshiping. And hopefully that will spark a lot of questions around um, what you're doing, what you may want to do, some things that we're, I'm picking up from other congregations and locations uh, around hybrid church. We'll do a quick other breakout, and then we'll just do a lot of Q&A uh, towards the end of our time. Be here until, you know, after uh, after 2 o'clock your time, 1, 11 o'clock my time. We'll go a little bit after that. and. Um, just hopefully it sparks some good conversation with folks as you're thinking about what is next for your congregation. Um, I do want to first introduce uh, myself to you all. Um, uh, as, as you know, uh, you're your, your exec was a, a former moderator. I'm a former moderator of our denomination. So I, I debated just starting this off with, um, you know, I'm kind of a big deal, but I also realized that most people in Presbyterian Church, uh, for moderators, they're like, whatever. So uh, it is, it, I think for, for all of us who have held that office, it is a deeply humbling, um, uh, amazing experience that, that causes us to have a deep affection for this denomination. And so, um, uh, uh, that's one part of my life, but a lot of folks don't actually know other parts of who I am. And so I want to do a little bit of introduction just very quickly. Uh, this is me uh, when I was about 18, almost 19 years old. I worked in a, a law firm in uh, Sacramento, California. Uh, this is uh, very 80s. I'm an 80s kid. So you can look at that computer and you can kind of tell what era that is from. I was in that, that stage of uh, going from uh, typing to keyboarding class that was that really that transition into computers. And so um, that's kind of, I grew up in that background. So I, I learned in high school how to uh, code. So I learned Fortran and COBOL and basic and all of those things. And I don't remember any of that stuff, but I do know that that helped me uh, be, be not just open to technology, but to, to see how it worked and what um, came out on the other side around community and, and what it did um, and what the possibilities were. So I grew up in that 
Um, I'm also a Presbyterian uh, from birth. Uh, I came out of Trinity Presbyterian Church in Stockton, California. Uh, that uh, the handsome gentleman too from the right is my grandfather, Esteban de los Reyes, who was a founding elder there. This church was started out of the farm worker strikes in the Central Valley of California. Uh, one of um, it's a it's always been a kind of a struggling church, but always a really diverse church, uh, and that's kind of my home. I'm West Coast born, raised, lived. Uh, I have uh, teased myself about living in other places that I've never actually done it, uh, but I'm, so I'm very California West Coast based. I currently serve uh, at First Presbyterian Church of Palo Alto in Palo Alto, California. Uh, it's about 30 miles from San Francisco where I lived for 30 years and we just moved here uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, we've actually been in pandemic mode uh, now just a little bit longer than we've uh, than, than we haven't been uh, while serving this congregation. Uh, it's a extremely justice oriented uh, progressive congregation, but it's older and it's wider and it's trying to figure out how to retell its story. So I'm kind of helping to um, figure out what that looks like uh, at First Presbyterian. Um, I have uh, three kids. Uh, and my eldest, uh, Ev, just started seminary at United in Minnesota, which is very exciting. I'm trying not to be too excited about that, but Ev just started seminary, so they are there. Uh, my middle daughter is uh, the one in the middle there, and uh, she is a sophomore at Scripps in Southern California, but because they're remote, she just moved to Chicago for two months to experience a little bit of fall and a tiny bit of winter. Uh, so this is apparently what kids are doing these days. And then my youngest in the, on the right-hand corner there is, um, is a senior in high school. So we're going through the college experience again. You get bonus points if you know what picture uh, this is because they are mimicking a uh, famous picture by a band. So uh, you may need to ask other generations, but uh, there you go, that's my family. As some of you know, I've been doing online community building and online embracing that community for a long time. Uh, in, in 2010, was uh, helping to lead an online worship on Twitter, uh, where we every Sunday evening, we would go through the order of worship and we'd have guest preachers and all of that. So this has been part of my life for a very long time and, and thinking about how we best use uh, technology and, and, and really embrace online community as, as something that's in addition to what we do in person. Uh, this is an early setting of, of our pulpit once we started pandemic uh, in the backyard. We can be in the backyard here in Palo Alto for most of the year, but since moved inside and here just, you know, I know that we all dress up fancy for uh, our worship because only, you know, you only see, I'm actually in shorts right now here. So uh, there we go. There's my quick intro. As we start into this, um, I also, I, I kind of, uh, you know, pastors, church leaders, folks kind of in charge of stuff as they're going through this pandemic time. Um, I think we have this tendency to believe that we can do everything and we should do everything. And always reminding myself because I am a, a overextender, overachiever, overwhelmed person and like to believe that it's okay for other people to take breaks and other people to, to give stuff up, but I'm not really good at that. And so I always have to remind myself that I can't do everything. I'm not good at everything and I shouldn't do everything. And then we all have our roles. And I would like to think as I've matured in ministry or if I've, I've been, you know, created crisis and come out of it that, that I'm getting better at that. But this is something I think we all have to remember is that we can't do everything, not every part of what we're doing um, and, and what we're called to in a church means you have to do absolutely every part. And sometimes we have to give things up because we might not have the capacity or the time or the bandwidth or the energy to do some things. And so when I think about that, I think about Ephesians. I also think about uh, Psalm 30. This was uh, my Hebrew class saying in when I was in seminary 25 years ago uh, that, you know, uh, weeping will, will be in the night, but lo, there will be joy in the morning. And I truly believe that. I do believe that um, our mornings come. We are resurrection people. I'm trusting God through all of this. And uh, at the end of the day, um, there will be life and new hope. And so um, I, if I, I try to embody that. I try to believe that. I try to live that out in everything um, that I do, not just in church, but just in this culture and climate that we're in right now. It would be so easy to let 
um, so much of that kind of uh, just uh, for us to absorb all of the division and hatred and dehumanizing and just awfulness that's out there. We can challenge it by still believing there's hope in, in the morning and, and fully believe that about church and about what we're going through as we lead our congregations. So um, I want to take you through just a, a little bit about um, how I have gone through this pandemic time, um, what it has meant for me, and I think and I hope it'll resonate a little bit just as an acknowledgement of this journey that we're on as church leaders, as folks who are um, trying to lead people through a time that is is making real these things that we've claimed to, to, to learn and to be, our adaptability, our compassion, our flexibility, all of this. Um, I, for me, I the, when this first started in early March for us, um, I was definitely in this, I got this stage, right? I was definitely in that stage where um, it was happening in our area. We actually, as a congregation, stopped worshiping a little bit before shelter in place um, was, was called in our area. And I went into this very, I think, natural and appropriate, is everybody going to be okay? Like, this is a crisis. We didn't really know what was going on. You know, shelter in place in this kind of magnitude was not something we were used to. And so quickly jumped into, I got to take care of my people. I got to take care of this church. You know, all of those things. Who, who and how are we going to make sure that everybody is cared for? Uh, if you were like me, you tried any and all things, whether folks liked them or not. I saw so many um, folks. We, I had people that were saying, gosh, all the pastors are over-functioning just a little bit. Because I think out of our deep care and concern, we were trying to, to make sure that folks are connected to the church and the folks knew that we were there and, and all of these things. So we tried multiple gatherings and worship, worship things and prayer groups and studies and, uh, you know, happy hours and all, all this kind of stuff. And well, we realized that not everybody was asking for that stuff, but uh, we were trying it. And we realized, and I realized that there was an amazing amount of grace that was just infiltrating everybody's spirit. And I think to some extent still is, but really as we are moving through all this, the, the amount of patience and grace that people had for one another and for leadership, I think was, was just simply beautiful. Um, so I think that first stage was we were all in crisis mode. We reacted well. We we're just doing what we felt needed to be done. And then we get into that mode of, I kind of was like, dear God, what are we doing? And that's where we really start to overfunction. Um, so my pattern and, uh, and patterns I've seen with other clergy and friends is we overfunction at the beginning. We discover that we get overextended, which I still do. Um, and then we get this overwhelmed mode. When you realize you've just taken on too much, you become overwhelmed. You try not to panic and then you eventually crash. And that is this kind of up and down that I think we probably all experience and some of it's faster than others. And sometimes it could be spread out. And so we crash and then we commit ourselves to self-care. We put out that we're going to take time. We tell other folks, take your time, take your care. Um, and then we probably just repeat that whole thing over again. And I know that for me, uh, needing to constantly remind myself about that self-care, breathe, don't get overextended, don't overfunction. That whole pattern for me uh, keeps sneaking back into my life as much as I don't want it to. And so I, but I just want to acknowledge, I think that this is, I think, very natural for us who are serving our congregations and are trying to tend to our folks as best we can. And so um, where I think a lot of folks are, are now and are starting to are moving through this kind of take a break moment where we've now been at this a long time. There's some things that are settling into normalcy and we can debate whether they should be or not. But there's now this time where we can begin to see this as this fluid, ever changing uh, uh, kind of space that is now the new normal. Now, many of us have always talked about life is constantly changing, changes more normal than anything. It's the only thing constant, all of that. But now we're really experiencing it. Like we can, we can put practical, specific uh, kind of words to what we're going through. Like all these things that have happened, we now know that week to week, month to month, things change in our political climate, things change when it comes to pandemic. And now we just have to figure out how we can navigate that well. So 
embracing that just means it's it, we really are beginning to see this as our new uh, normal experience. And I'm hearing more and more people now reflect on how we've been modeling adaptive leadership and practices to think back and, and understand how we've gotten to where we have gotten. Uh, what are the ways in which we have modeled adaptability? What are the ways that we have heightened anxiety for people or lowered anxiety for people? It's an opportunity now for us to, we have a, we have a, a, a track record now of these six, seven months to look back and see how have we done, you know, how have we done well? How have we thrived? How have we helped our community learn about itself? How have we helped leaders in our own churches kind of take ownership? All of these things, we have this, this, this break time to begin to think about this. And I hope what's happening, and I know that's for me and others, that we're beginning to reimagine and dream about the future, that we're really beginning to say, now that this is where we are, what are we going to be? And so I think the next stage that many of us are at, and, and probably many of you are, as things are, are shifting and changing, is that we now get to do stuff. And, and one of the things that I think is important for us to do is to remember and reflect on how you have led change before. What are the ways in which you have engaged your community in positive change? Because the way that you were able to do that, the way you were able to kind of lead your folks into understanding, into movement, uh, and into decision making, um, isn't going to be a lot different than now. Things are magnified and maybe sped up a little bit. But really thinking about how you've done this in the past, this isn't like you're just, this isn't new. It's a new issue and problem and thing that we're trying to address. But you, my guess is you already have the skill set and the experience to lead people through this change. And so um, encouraging folks to really remember and somewhat rejoice in these things that you've done in the past. If you haven't already, and I'm sure many of you have, is to really start thinking seriously about what church looks like in six months in a year and longer, and to really start to put practical um, ideas about what that could look like. Not to make them, uh, you're not going to make them concrete, and you don't want them to calcify in your mind so you can't be flexible. But at this point, um, beginning to have some vision about where you think and where your community thinks it's going to be and what it might look like will help us actually start building adaptive strategies. So we'll actually kind of begin to say, okay, here are the things we need to think about in order to get to this space. And that's what I'll talk about in our second half. What are the things we need to do? What's the groundwork we need to play in order to get to this space where I think we are headed? And so really beginning to, again, whatever strategies you've used before, how did you use that in order to lead your people, lead your congregation into a place of embracing change? The one thing I want to say about this whole thing uh, for pastors and for all of us is uh, I've, I've, and I don't know if it's fortunate or whatever, but in, this, in the light of my experiences and things that I love to talk about, I get to spend a lot of time with pastors lately. And over and over again, folks will say how surprised they are at how well their church has managed the pandemic. And I, I always room for, leave room for grace to surprise. I don't, I'm not trying to say don't do that. But at the same time, I'm like, well, what does that say about what you think about your leadership if you're surprised that the congregation you're leading is doing so well? And it's not to be arrogant. It's not to kind of toot your own horn. And I don't think, and I think most pastors actually are so humble that at a certain level, you shouldn't be surprised, right? If you have loved your people through crisis, if you've loved your people through change, if you love them through the turmoils of just being church in the world, you shouldn't be surprised. Like this is what we do. And this is how you and I have been trained to lead people. And hopefully it's in positive ways. Now that's not always going to be perfect, but I just, at, at anytime you hear yourself kind of saying, I'm surprised at how well our church has done, you know, I mean, I think there's an element of like, don't be surprised. I mean, if you've been leading your congregation, well, they've, they've kind of, you know, you, you've, you, they've embraced the, uh, the adaptability and the flexibility. And so kudos, if your congregation is doing really well through this and, and uh, all of that has happened, I think there's, there's a lot of credit can be gone, uh, gone to your, your pastor leadership. Of course, you know, don't take that overboard, but I just want to um, point that out. All right. So before we jump into hybrid uh, uh, specifics, I just want us to give us a time to have some community time to have some sharing. And so we're, um, uh, we'll get, Cindy is going to break you up into groups. 
And your two questions are this, how are you feeling about the current state of your ministry? Um, and what have you learned about yourself and about the congregation you serve? So introduce yourself, name, pronouns, ministry, wherever you are, um, current state of your ministry, and what have you learned about the congregation and yourself? All right, so I'm gonna stop right. sharing and you'd all go into groups for, and this will be short, it'll be 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. So, uh, I'm gonna move one person because we've got a room with uh, just two people in it. So here we go. We'll see you back in 10 minutes. Welcome back as you come back from your breakout rooms. I know that was not a lot of time, but we have, you'll have a second chance to get together with those folks uh, later on in the presentation. All right. Is everybody back? I believe so. All right. All right. Uh, with such a big group, we won't we won't do kind of share back. But um, uh, grateful that you had some of that time to have some conversations. And feel free to use the chat if you want and hang out with each other and talk about it. But I'm going to keep going because I want to make sure we have some time uh, enough time to interact um, with folks. So um, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and share again. And uh, so um, again, uh, I, I kind of always, uh, in the middle of all of this stuff, I'm always amazed at the grace that is offered. Uh, in our service, uh, we have one slide that basically says, this will not be perfect. And uh, just remind ourselves all the time that this will not be a perfect experience. And I don't think that folks expect it to. And if you have people that are starting to get nitpicky, um, I kind of, uh, I've had a few people start to get a little nitpicky and I kind of actually see that as a positive because they've settled in to a space where they now care about it. Uh, and, uh, but I think for the most part, you know, folks are, are, are and will continue to be flexible about how you uh, create a uh, Zoom experience. Um, I wanna start, before I start talking about the hybrid piece, uh, just one, um, uh, kind of not even an issue but question you know there there are probably always going to be folks in your congregations somewhere in your own spirit and other places where uh we're forced into this conversation that um between online and in person and that one is better than the other uh and that we're trying to get towards a certain thing and i just simply don't engage in that debate because i i believe that they uh, they enhance each other. There isn't one that is better than the other. In fact, in today's world, I think we need both ways to interact with each other, especially in diverse communities and uh, all the ways in which we uh, are separated by, um, whether it's by circumstance or by choice, whatever it might be, that there's ways for us to connect. Um, the biggest issue I have when people tell me that in-person is just better than online is that uh, it's based on the assumption that all of our in-person congregational interactions are good. And I simply know and don't believe that that is the case. I wish they were all good and healthy, but we know that that's not true. I mean, my little congregation growing up that I, you know, my little home church, 
uh, you know, Sunday morning, you didn't get to dive deep into conversations with people unless there was a kind of a big crisis and you connect with the folks. But for the most part, most of the conversations that gave texture and depth to our relationships happened in the parking lot or happened online or other places. Uh, so that this idea that in person is the ideal always, I simply don't buy that because um, I've been engaged and others have been engaged in online communities that are just as meaningful and just as powerful uh, and between uh, in person. So I don't see those as uh, in conflict at all. I see them as intricately woven together and needing to kind of embrace that if we're going to move into this next stage of what many of you are thinking about in terms of your worship experience and church life experience. Um, just so I, you know, as I think about this, as I'm approaching this with the congregation I'm serving and talking with people, is that I think all of us need to be able to articulate not just a practical, not just a here's how we can continue to worship together, but what's your theological understanding of being church in a new way, of being church in a more uh, online, in-person experience? How are you going to um, uh, kind of talk about this with folks? How is it going to infiltrate uh, how you go about building th uh, theological foundations for creating different worship experiences. Uh, and so as you're thinking about this to make sure that you can articulate uh, an understanding, a theological understanding of, of why you want to do this. Um, questions that will arise for folks is, you know, it, is there such thing as real church versus not real church? I think that's certainly beginning to change as folks are experiencing online community now more than ever. Um, and then uh, the, another question to begin to remind ourselves is, um, as you're thinking about uh, this hybrid experience is, is when you cross the line between uh, worshiping what you do and worshiping God and, and kind of this idea that there is only one way to experience the divine. There's only one way. You have to have certain things in order for it to be legitimate. These are questions that I think any worship team community needs to make sure they're beginning to understand so that you can build out uh, worship experiences that reflect your theological understanding and your practical understanding of what you're trying to create. Um, for me, uh, I think about this in, in that metaphorical table experience that um, when we stand up front and we talk about all are welcome at the table, when we were in our, con in our sanctuaries, we stood in front of a table and that table had history, uh, it had, uh, you know, multiple folks had served and stood around that table and, and, and all of that. And we talked about it metaphorically, right? This is the table that is open to all of God's people. We would never say this is a table that's only open to the people in this building right now. But we, now we kind of get to say this table, this online, virtual, Zoom, whatever table is now open it really is open to everyone. And so come. And I think now we're giving the chance again to, to, to live out this metaphorical kind of uh, theological understanding in real time. And I, 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 that's the, I love that part about it. So you know, we, we have communion every Sunday and from the beginning, because I think it, it theologically makes sense to say, this is the table around who um, God's people are gathered and all are welcome. And now we are actually saying that no matter where you come from into this space, you are welcome to the table. So, um, as you're thinking about hybrid church, as you're thinking about what it means to uh, create this, this mixed experience in worship, before I get to some tactical things, uh, I think one of the most, the, the, I think the key way that this will work is if you've created lived community that is both online and in person already. Uh, that if you've created community experiences, whether it's your worship experience, whether it's small groups, whether whatever it could be, um, create lived experience that is already uh, online, hybrid. Um, what that will create is that when folks come into the building, they're going to miss the people they've been interacting with. So as I think about our congregation moving into what is next, there are people who are worshiping with us now from multiple countries, other cities and states, and they're never going to set foot into the sanctuary at First Presbyterian Church of Palo Alto. But folks are going to miss them. And so I think I no longer have to kind of justify why we need to do this as much because now people are saying our community 
has expanded and how do we truly stay connected to those who are in this community now. So creating this lived community now is gonna help with creating a more natural transition into this, this hybrid uh, worship experience. For me, uh, our, our, the, the story I use about our congregation is we have one family that there are four generations that gather for worship from Hawaii to New York. And they gather and worship every Sunday. And you hear somebody always say, hey, grandma. And uh, you know, one of the parents tells the child to turn on their screen. And I mean, it is, and, and now that is part of our community. And if we don't have that, we lose a significant number of connections. So finding lived community so that others, so folks are gonna miss each other basically. Um, the other thing is, um, uh, as you're beginning to develop this lived community, as as you're thinking about how you talk about uh, worship, how you how you lead worship, beginning to change your language, begin to change language that no longer centers on the physical space, the physicality of. So as you're thinking about how you even talk about um, uh, things on your current worshiping experience, how much of that centers around the ideal church is if you're in our space. So begin to think, how do you welcome people? How do you talk about what's happening? You can be geographically centered as a historic kind of flavoring for your congregation, but not that worshiping in the community is the, it, worshiping in your sanctuary is the ideal expression of worship. Really kind of in, in our language and words, how are we making this new experience the new norm for how we worship together? Living uh, community means creating more intimate spaces. We have, The thing we lose the most, I think for most congregations, it's fair to say, uh, we miss two things. We miss singing together and we miss touching. Uh, and so what does it mean for us to try to recreate these intimate experiences as best we can? So creating live community that joins each other together so that, again, they're going to miss folks if they don't um, continue to worship with them. Um, there are things, so our congregation, we, we set up old-fashioned pen pals. So we now have uh, paired people both uh, from our area as well as outside, and they just write each other's notes, like old-school pen pals, just to create these other interactions. Our Care and Compassion team, which is kind of like a deacon's committee, they've been more attentive to our congregational members than ever before to create these connections with each other, to make sure that folks get to experience the intimacy that they don't get to have in our worshiping experience. We have not figured out the singing together. That's gonna, you know, whoever figures that out is gonna win the game. Um, and then um, I would be, as you're thinking about how you're going to do this, there is gonna be inertia uh, that's gonna pull people back to what you did before. And it's gonna be subtle, and it's, but it's going to be there. And so how you push back early on what you might be headed back to is really important. So begin to think about, are there elements of where you were before, uh, what you did before that are not gonna translate into an online experience? And if so, then I would not do it, right? You can only, if you're really gonna do this in a hybrid true experience, what you do in the sanctuary has to translate to an online experience. And so um, beginning to kind of push back about against those things that um, are going to kind of hold you back and are going to, to reinforce an idea that being in the sanctuary is the ideal and epitome of your worship experience. Push back against those things. All right, so let me talk about equipment. A little bit. So this is a this is a, a version of the station that I use now, um, and. What, what you're going to need to think about is you're setting this up in your own sanctuary are all the pieces that you're going to need uh, to drive sound and video and all of that through uh, through your sanctuary. We don't have ours set up yet. And so we're, we're in our early stages of looking at how this is going to happen. Um, but, you know, so your microphones, um, you have to figure out, uh, again, think about directional how things are running through your system into a mixer and back out into however you're gonna be casting out to Zoom. So as you're thinking about your microphones, thinking about directional sound. So what is how is the sound traveling in order to get it back into Zoom? And then how is it coming back out? So your, the, how you think about your microphone and your sound system um, is gonna be important. Not, I would say most pastors don't have capacity to do this. 
So if you have sound people, then really think about the, the, the signal direction. Of this, uh, so how is, mute, how is your sound flowing in and how is it flowing out and how are you able to um, go through it? You, you, should be, you should need to be able to go through a mixer board so that you can adjust all the volumes on multiple microphones in a particular space. Think about your lighting, still think about your lighting. Even in, back in your sanctuary, so many sanctuaries are too dark and so we need to think about lighting. This is, uh, I think, lighting in the sanctuary that you can now see. Don't try to hide it. It's one reminder that you're you are creating a space for people who are not in that particular worshiping space. So if you need to create and set up photography lights um, close to the to a, the pulpit or whatever you're going to call it, um, I would do that actually because it's a reminder to people who are in the space that this is not just for them, but it's for everyone else. So you got to think about your lighting. Um, think about multiple screens. So I use multiple screens. You can't really see there's a third screen to the right of our of my communion elements there um, where I watch everything. So if your if your church is doesn't have the capacity for multiple screens already, Chromebooks are wonderful for second monitors. Um, they're not very expensive. You can easily put uh, use a Chromebook very simple as a second monitor, not as your host computer, but as a second monitor, a third monitor to be able to, to either put cameras on uh, images or to just watch and make and see how um, uh, how the how the worship production is looking to everyone else. So second, third screens uh, are always important to do. Um, I use uh, a timer uh, for a lot of the stuff that I do uh, so that I make sure that I'm uh, kind of keeping time to make sure that the flow goes really well. So we do things like we'll do two minutes of silence at the beginning of our uh, of things. We'll do some other elements where I will always have a timer just to kind of keep me aware. Um, you know, not everybody wants, needs to do that, but that's something that I particularly do. Um, I, I think about how I'm going to script and read and all of that. And now that you're going to be looking at a screen or you're going to look at other things, what does it mean for you? How are you going to follow a script or not? Uh, this is for multiple people in your sanctuary now who are trying to uh, follow along with what you might be leading or your worship team is leading uh, to just, you know, um, we have everything mapped out, typed out, written in process. So some of you probably already do this. Those of you who are used to just wing and worship, I would highly, highly recommend that you begin to map it out a little stronger because now you're going to have multiple people that need to follow along with what you're doing. Now, if you've been doing production at a higher level, slides, multiple monitors, multiple people, and you do this already, this is, nor this is natural normal, but to think about how you're going to, to do this. Increase your cable um, so everybody's plugged in. Make sure everything is plugged in. No more, no Wi-Fi in your sanctuary. Um, so you need to increase your internet speed if you need to, and always have spares of everything. So if things start to go down, again, if you're a tech person, you probably already have all this. But if, uh, however, you may want to have things go down uh, when things ha when things happen, have spares. So I currently in my like sitting where I am, I have two. Uh, spare headphones always sitting around me so that I can always plug in if something goes wrong. Um, I have multiple lights right here uh, that are happening. I have a couple of microphones that I can use. So if there's ever a chance that something goes out, I can always flip around. So uh, easing your own mind about anything that could possibly happen, um, have spares for, for everything. And then uh, lastly, again, I want to just reinforce the sound component is going to be your friend or your enemy during most of this. Uh, and so making sure that, that you have a sound person that can help you if you have multiple microphones uh, to help how you mix that back into your uh, whatever system you're going to use and then be able to shift the sound back out in a way that isn't going to interfere with microphones that are picking up sound. So this is really going to be dependent upon your, um, your space and your capacity, but that's going to be one of the most frustrating pieces if folks can't hear people and if sound is um, garbled on either end, it'll just make the experience not as uh, worshipful as possible. 
All right, I've uh, got a few more things uh, and then we're gonna do some Q and A. Um, so again, curated, um, uh, when you're looking at your space itself, physical reminders, that the sanctuary is not the center of the worship experience. So in my space, I, um, there's, we have a, a, a chancel at the, at, the, at the front, I have two lights on either side, my computer and uh, um, uh, an easel in front. And so I can see the few people that are going to be in the congregation, but also folks who are on the screen. And so being able to, to remind people that I'm not just leading worship for folks that are right here at in front, but actually people that are on the screen. So any physical reminders of that for the people that are experiencing worship and yourself, I think is going to help, especially at the beginning. And again, think about this. Um, if any of you DJed in any time in your life, um, think about it as your DJ station, right? You're 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 creating space. You're engaging people, and you're creating the space that is worshipful and life giving. You're not just doing something so they can watch you. You're trying to create the music of uh, that's going to create create emotional, spiritual, intellectual movement. And so, what does that mean for you? Again, you're not just trying to say, "Look what I'm doing," and you're just going to watch but how do you create interactivity within that space? Um, one of the ways to do that in terms of physicality is rearrange your seating. We're having conversations about rearranging pews, even if just for a season, start rearranging so that folks actually can see each other. If you're in a multi-purpose space and can do that already, that's great. Most of us are not. Um, I would say if there's ever a chance to talk about pew shifting, this is it because you can justify the ability for us to see each other, for us to see people on screens, if you're gonna mount screens in around the sanctuary so you can see who's on Zoom. Uh, this is an opportunity, um, you know, never waste a good crisis in many ways, right? This is one where you might be able to, to sneak in that pew rearrangement conversation. A few other things, um, um, it, find a way to show projection to all people. Um, so in, in terms of who's there. So what we are looking at is we're looking at four screens in corners uh, that will each have uh, projected uh, the, the, the uh, different, um, uh, the Zoom screen. So you see different people, which means that we'll have four laptops that are gonna swipe through. And so that it's not the same picture on each of them. Um, and that, you know, that's, that takes a team of people to do, but that way everybody's in the sanctuary. So you have people kind of in this middle, in the circle, and then we have screens that are going to swipe through the pages so that everybody is actually in there. So when I look up, I can see everybody who's actually in the congregation. This means that on Zoom, you have to lock people into the viewer of the host so that they will see exactly what you see and you can make sure that everybody's screens, uh, what they're seeing is the same. So that way you can have four different views of Zoom at the same time. Um, use the chat and the Q&A function. Um, I wish that there was a Q&A function for meetings, but if you're in a webinar style, you can use it. Use the chat, have somebody monitoring the chat so they can have questions, prayers, uh, but really so that you, as you're leading, calling on folks, as your liturgists are calling on folks, whatever, that um, those folks are having interaction with you. Upgrade your technology and internet speed. There is money out there now. I don't know what your presbytery is doing or judicory is doing, but there is often money to be available to upgrade. Take advantage of that. Get your internet speed up as fast as it can so that you're not creating the lag on other people's computers. Um, practice and practice some more. Uh, we have a team of four people that are learning how to host our worship and they're practicing all the time, just trying to make sure that they all kind of can, can lead worship smoothly and so that the technology doesn't become a distraction. Um, and the last thing I'd point you to is there's a new company that I just met with them yesterday called Alter Live. And they are one of the first groups that are beginning to think about what does it look like to have this, have a technology that's built on the Zoom platform that is going to do, do the things that churches need. So for example, um, one of the things that I have asked for a function and that they're working on is to have a Q&A function in a meeting setting. So in your worship setting, you don't have to look at the chat you can just have a Q&A. So if you do interactive sermons, you just have to track Q&A and not the chat. Um, there's, um, it's a church group. It's actually based in Boston, 
So, um, but they are really thinking about what this might look like. You can actually, um, there are churches already using it and uh, I haven't looked at it yet. I don't have stock in them. I don't get anything from it, but I'm finding this really intriguing as it's the first group that is really pushing out how a, a technology that's not gonna create, uh, make us have workarounds for Zoom, but it's actually gonna create a technology that allows us to use uh, this a little bit in a more hybrid sense. All right, a few other things I wanna give you around worship. If you haven't already created your tech team, um, tech deacons are so important. Uh, start to nurture those folks wh who are the tech folks in your community who, can, who, who are able to um, monitor, uh, mute, all that kind of stuff. So you can give all that away. Um, in a hybrid experience, always have somebody from outside the building in leading worship. So whether you preach from home on occasion, uh, your liturgist comes in from home, you have an offering person, a mission coworker from another country coming in, always have outside voices into the sanctuary. Again, reminding folks that this the, the best part of Zoom is you can bring people from the outside. Continue to do that. Think through ritual that doesn't create in and out. So how we do communion, how we do laying on of hands, how we do baptisms, that's going to be an integral part of how we go about creating this sense of, of uh, both hybrid and in person, or the in person and virtual. So that again, you're not drawing the center of worship is, is physical, but how do you create these rituals that are also virtual? So um, I suspect that when we move back in, our communion um, will be led by myself, who will be in the sanctuary, and another pastor, one of our parish associates, who will be online, and they will do that together. Um, we're hoping for some adult baptisms in the spring. We may do that both virtually and uh, it, you know, somewhere um, at, at, on our campus. We're playing with to make sure that every ritual we do, how can we do it so it feels legitimate and it feels real both online and in person? And the last thing, uh, I would just continue to leverage the best thing about Zoom is your interaction. So how do you create interaction um, on, on Zoom? So polls and your breakout groups um, and chat. I think um, the chat during worship, I know it bugs some people. I love how much interaction happens in our chat room on Sunday. So would encourage you to continue to use all of that. All right. Um, we are, um, I just want, I actually want to just to go to Q&A and skip this next breakout if that's okay, Cindy. Um, so we can have some more conversations about things. That is a lot of stuff all at once. Um, and um, there you go. It's like drinking from water hose. Welcome to people's world when they talk to Bruce. So questions. Um, I have not been tracking the chat. So hopefully, look at me, look. So, um, uh, all right. So uh, I don't know how we want to do that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say reach out to Ultra Life, Cindy. I had a great conversation yeah. with them yesterday. Um, they're looking for input. Um, I haven't looked at it yet exactly yet. I have the betas, there, um, but I would totally... I'm not hearing of anybody else really taking this on in a way that is not just a bunch of pastors that think they have a good idea. These are folks who understand the technology and are entrepreneurs. So they're making sure that this is one going to be feasible. And uh, so I would totally reach out to them. Great. Well, I will definitely do that. Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, chatter in the chat, which is yes. great. And again, you can put a I don't even know where to chat. start. <laughs> you can use your, your blue hand. Um, and so just to clarify, one of the earlier questions that will be further up is that, that this is really looking at a both and. But, I mean, yes. right now, for most places, having a large group in the sanctuary isn't safe. Yep. Um, and so for right now, the only people in the sanctuary is a really, really small group, maybe just the people who are leading worship. But towards the future, when there is yep. a vaccine, when it is indeed safe for people to gather and belt out their favorite hymn and receive the elements and pass the peace, we're looking at a completely hybrid experience. Yep, yep. And, and I think this is where you're beginning, for me, uh, and I shared in our group, we, we are probably not going to seriously even think about going back until Easter, April 4th. Yeah. And even then, 
it's going to be a small group because we've been told by most of our congregation that they're not coming back in for two reasons. One, they don't, they, they want to be safe and totally get that. Um, and our online experience has been pretty positive. So they're not yearning for something better. In fact, um, you know, we're, we now, I'm seeing an increase of people worshiping from not their homes. So we have four people that are in RVs that worship with us. A uh, couple of people last week were at the beach. Like they're like, well, we can just go. So, I mean, I think you're finding people adapting and I'm like, oh, I'm in my office. You're at the beach. <laughs> uh, so, right. <laughs> I mean, I think they're, I think they're, if, if it's going well, folks are starting to adapt at how this worship experience works for them. Mm -hmm. So, but I would say, as you're thinking a year out, this is going to be real for 25 people, 50, whatever you're safe, we can gather. There will be folks who are going to want to come back in. And what does that mean for, as you're thinking about preparing people for that experience and yourself really. Um, so, you know, I think we're, I, I think if I'm thinking realistically, we're looking at summer till we really think about a hybrid yeah. hybrid experience. Yeah. Um, but anyway, all right. So, um, so we have uh, Carla's got a hand raised. Carla, okay. I asked you to mute yourself. Hi, thank you. I just uh, was confused because you were talking about, well, I was confused for the whole thing, but, <laughs> but um, when you say that when you are recording uh, in the sanctuary and you have two screens on each side uh, is that for the congregation to look at because uh, I, my congregation is this big so we, yeah, we so you could yeah you could do one screen but the idea is to project the faces that you normally see on zoom right so you would see this the screen you're looking at if you're in gallery view that's the screen you would you would also people in the sanctuary would also see, and I'm I think it's really important to make that screen as big as you can. You can now buy, uh, if you look at um, on on anything like Amazon or anything like that, you can now buy these massive theater screens that you just pop up for you know a couple hundred bucks now that you can that are much bigger than just. Please don't use one of those small tripod. Um, screens because everybody's faces will be like two inches big. Use a larger screen so that folks can actually see their faces, which also means getting a projector that works for your space. And those price points have come down so much that to find a projector that works for your space. And um, if you're smaller, it's almost makes it easier. So you can have one huge screen. And I'm talking, when I say big, I'm talking like six, eight feet wide yeah, so that faces are actually seen. And you can kind of, if, if it was a small church, I would say you put yourself in a, uh, in kind of a, a semicircle around the screen so that people can watch it. And then you have a camera or two that are facing from the screen to the congregation so that the people on Zoom are also seeing into the congregation as well as your face on one of the screens on one of the squares. So you're trying to create the cross section of viewing faces, which is mm -hmm. ultimately what people want. I want to see each other. So is that is that helpful? No. Right. And and the fact that you're confused through my whole thing is pretty much every Sunday at our church. So I'm used to that. <laughs> so uh, Eric has his hand raised. I've asked you to unmute yourself. Um, a couple of things that I've been doing <clears throat> is visiting some of our local Brazilian congregations who have online and in-house worship going on at a pretty phenomenal level every single Sunday. They have incredibly well set up systems. They've spent anywhere from twenty to $30,000 to put these systems in place, but they're incredibly helpful. And they're more than willing to give you advice, tell you who they're using. Um, and also another thing that we did because we didn't have a choice, we did a funeral online, a Zoom service funeral. 
and the families could join from across the United States. And some of them were older and couldn't travel to possibly get to the and they loved it. At yeah. first they were like, this is, this is a horrible idea, but at the end, they were like, this was so tremendous. We can't believe we had this opportunity, um, but I'm gonna get in touch with Alter uh, Group. Yeah, and most most um, um, funeral homes now are offering all of their services on Zoom, so they'll have a small group of people. I've I've done a couple of services where it was me and like three members of the family, and it was all on Zoom as well. We've done some worship things as well. One little tr um, thing, as long as you're still in worship um, on Zoom, uh, one of the new features for Zoom is you can lock um, you can lock pictures in a certain place and then force everybody else to see your same screen. Um, I've added a second camera, uh, which you can't, like you can see, I have another swing arm here and I have an alt, uh, a, a chancel here and I mount my phone to this and log in again. So we have a candle and chancel that's in the left-hand corner of every, of worship the whole time for, for, for um, memorial services. That way you can also put the picture and a candle of the person and have that sitting up there. There are multiple things now with the Zoom experience, again, if you're before hybrid, um, that you can now do with all the new upgrades. Putting up to nine people in spotlight at the same time means that you can ordain and install elders all at once and everybody sees their faces. There's all that kind of stuff uh, before you had to um, kind of, uh, um, uh, hybrid space that that's a great there's some really good things to do with, with with zoom now i see john all right john i'm asking you to unmute yourself hi there um john sawyer here uh we are doing um just straight up live streaming the service from the sanctuary and not zoom uh so i think i mean you're talking about the you know the wonderful interaction that you get you know as as you go through the service just wondering what besides um, shifting some language in our service, as well as uh, maybe curating um, chat, um, would we do to kind of, you know, uh, foster that in that additional engagement? Right. So are you, do you think you're going to stay streaming only even when you come back, which is totally fine, but is that, are you trying to shift to a Zoom experience or more uh, I, Right now, I think we're shift. Uh, we, we are just. I think I think the mindset here is just the live streaming, um, okay. but we will continue once yeah. we once right. we uh, come back. Yeah. To so the if you haven't already set up um, uh, a tech team that is is uh, like we call them tech deacons that are sitting in all of the chat spaces that you're you're. Uh, streaming to if it's Facebook or YouTube or whatever you're doing it to, to help create that community there so that just as much as, as the interaction or the leadings happening in the sanctuary that you're having people in, in the chat room, that's probably not you because you're leading worship, who are making people interact more. Like at, like when you ask a question in a sermon, somebody's asking that and making sure people are interacting. Uh, how you welcome new people in, how you greet them in that space, being much more intentional about almost like if you think about how we would ideally like to welcome new people when they come into a sanctuary, which we don't always do well, but if we did it well, what would that look like in an online space? Hey, welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself if you'd like. Um, and then you, so you get folks who are in charge of that space so that it, it is not seen as, oh, and then there's the chat room. It's like, we welcome all of you who are here. If you're in the chat on Facebook, uh, thank you for spending time with us this morning. We look forward to engaging with you during this hour or whatever you're gonna, you know, whatever you say. So really create, like your language would, would welcome in that space just as valid as the space right in front of you. So however that needs to shift and assigning people to, to have that role, uh, that will make it seem more important and, and kind of lift it up. And that's going to be part of the shift as well in terms of considering who is elected to leadership in the church. Should your elders, should your session reflect the fact that you are a church that goes beyond the walls? Should there be elders who will never maybe set foot on the property, yep. but who are active in yep. the church? 
And same with we're having we're having our first new members class, and we we suspect that we're going to have members join who will never visit our sanctuary. And and what does that mean? All right. So uh, Deb McKinley, I am inviting you to unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? All right. So this is yeah. good. Thank you. Cindy, you are such a rebel. Elders not part of our physical space. Come on. What? So Bruce, Bruce, I I am. This is very exciting, and um, it's fun to imagine it. And then we bump up against the reality of course, <laughs> of congregations. But anyway, thank you for it. But I'm wondering, can we can we worship with you on a given Sunday just to watch what it just to experience what it's like at your church i mean is there a way for us to access that because i would love to just explain. yeah so we haven't we haven't moved to our hybrid experience yet okay so but you could worship with so so the secret uh, one of i think we have we probably have three or four pastors that worship with us secretly every sunday because we're 10 o'clock on we're 10 o'clock on west coast time so when they're on vacation or they're doing something else or they just want to like it's one o'clock worship and i have friends who are like this is great it's one o'clock so yeah, anytime we just have a link on our website. That you just have to register and you get brought Great. in. Yeah. And, yeah, that's First Church at Palo Alto. Yeah, First Presbyterian Palo Alto. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I'll put that link in the chat, which Bruce could probably type it in faster than I can. But <laughs> well, if you can't find us just naturally, normally online, then we're in trouble. <laughs> Boom. There you go. And I, I just want to say that um, the idea of people not physically present being drawn into leadership is biblical. We have biblical stories about that. It was way before the it age is, of it Zoom. Is, it is going to challenge and push on people who are strict constitutionalists in our denomination. I think that's going to be, there's going to be some wrangling around, um, are you really, I mean, we talked about this, laying hands on somebody, like what, what's legitimate and what isn't but i'm i'm all for going through the wall so <laughs> uh kingsley i see you i'm going to invite you to mute yourself and go ahead hi hi everyone uh i just had a question about uh, zoom i know uh we all use zoom for teacher services and stuff and just to prevent uh you know there's always a hack out there people bumping into the wrong session and stuff like that my question is about uh password wise is there a way we can set up like a password where uh, it changes like every month or do we have to do that manually? Yeah, so so the way that we've handled our security is we make everybody register, but once you're registered, it's always the same link. Okay. And we do use a way, we use the waiting room. So we scan as good as possible if there are any funky names that people are trying, like if John Smith shows up, we're like, hmm. So, you know, there's lots of that. Um, we, we, have, we, have, we have erred on the side of making it more open by using those two things. But the, the reality is for, um, if somebody really wants to get at a congregation individually, um, uh, they're gonna get in. I mean, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna get in if, you're, if somebody's targeting a specific congregation. Using the wait, waiting room is, I think, one of the most effective ways because what, when a Zoom bomber comes in who's random, they're not going to wait around. Uh, so we have not been Zoom bombed at all in our time. And those are the two things that we do. So we embed the password, make it a one click, um, and we make people register, and there's a waiting room. We also communicate one way into the waiting room before um, our worship starts, before we open the doors. And we ask people to change their names to the preferred name they wanna use and the preferred pronouns so that, we're, so that we give the impression that we're checking. Um, but we're, we really, I mean, we have anywhere from you know, 85 to 110 people logging on. We're not checking people. So, but just how you know, folks can, you're, you're sending signals to bombers that we're, take, we're, we're careful with this. I will say uh, one of the things I've asked Alter Live to do is to create, and they've working on this, which I think is really interesting. They've created a, a way that they're, you're in a lobby. If you've registered before you ought, and you're a name that was been approved, you automatically get in. 
If you're a first time visitor, there's a little bit of a pause so that you can um, get their name, figure out. That, so there's, they've built in a two way lobby, um, which is great. So again, I haven't used any of it, but the things they're talking about has, has, has said to me that they've been think, look, listening to churches. So waiting room and registration, I, we've found a, a huge amount of success. I wouldn't change the link week to week, week to week um, with the new password. I think you'll just lose too many people. It'll get too confusing for folks. We have a lot of All questions right. in the chat. I just want to <laughs> say out loud something that, that may be assumed but hasn't necessarily been said is that because all of our churches are in, in different places, literally, I mean, our congregations are in different places with different ways of coming together, different cultures, different experiences, that every church is going to have to figure this out. There, there isn't oh, going yeah. to be a one-size-fits-all model. So for East Crassbury, Vermont, or Leeds, Maine, or Church of the Covenant, downtown Boston, all of these places are going to look different. One may be just simply streaming a service. One may find that, that worship, a hybrid worship service doesn't make sense, but hybrid activities during the week might make sense. So definitely not yeah, a one size you. fits all conversation. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, I kind of in my initial, one of my comments about just trust your leadership is that you all have to translate this for your communities. I mean, I think that that's one of our main jobs is understanding the nuance and intricacies and complexities of our communities. And you'll have to translate this in a way that pushes, but not so much that it becomes irrelevant. And so uh, thank you, Cindy, for, for naming that. I think that is, that's very true. And, I, and it is a perfectly legitimate response to say, we can't do this. I actually mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. it is just like, this is, it's, it's like, um, this is not the next thing that everybody needs to do in order to be, have worth as a church. Uh, you know, there's, there are many ways to be church and there always should be. And so figuring out the best way to do that for your community um, is important. Oh, I see another hand. All right, Sarah. Hi, um, thank you so much, um, Reverend, for leading this and for Cindy putting this together. Um, I'm a chaplain along with another uh, Presbyterian minister here in Boston at a retirement community. Um, and so I guess in the back of my mind, like the system we've set up has been working okay. Um, but as you talk about people getting on Zoom and pre-registering and all those things, like, I wonder if you can speak to mm -hmm. how, I mean, so let me just state something obvious. Our church is old, like, <laughs> broadly, our denomination, What? right? There are not a lot of young people <laughs> in the Presbyterian church anymore. So we're talking a lot about providing these things through technology, but like getting people to the technology yep. mm -hmm. is something that my my colleague and I have kind of been struggling with. Um, so I wonder how, if yep. you can speak to that. Oh, yeah, I could totally talk. So um, I got lots of thoughts about that because our congregation is old, but mighty. Um, and they, I mean, they're, these are like old school, uh, like justice seekers, this is, you know, this is Robert McAfee Brown's church. And so this is the place where all these folks were just causing problems and still are. And um, so they're, they're, um, but they're getting older. And so one of the things that we made sure we did, there's a few things I think are helpful practices is really embrace tech deacons, finding ways to see this as a ministry to connect people. And uh, so it's on the phone, it's whatever it is multiple ways to connect into the service. So creating the, the, your, the phone link that's easy that people can just call in and there's no password required, they can just call in. And then the, the, the other thing, uh, that there's two components to actually, if you can get an iPad or something in front of them, a lot of our retirement communities now have integrated that into their services because of COVID that they've now have somebody um, so we have a, a variety of people. What the, the easiest thing that we did is we created one login that we just kind of have as a church that we give to people so they don't have to register. So it's just a link. And what happens is they come on and it'll say church office and our tech deacons know kind of who has that link. So when they come into the service, 
um, and so we see them, they can change their name. So we, we rather than to make them go through a registration process, which some might, some might not, um, we have a, we do have a saved link that um, we registered as a church. And if you hand that link out, it's it's unique. So it'll always come in um, under church office, and then we just change the name. So that's one of the ways that we've found um, that's been helpful. But really, it, depending on their capacity, like we have a person who's 92 and is in late stage dementia, and her helper, her family wants her to be in there. And so her helper just comes in, hits the link and puts it in front of Mitzi. And Mitzi tracks for 10 or 15 minutes. And But folks just love seeing her. And But it's that was really the, the, the retirement community brings it in, hits the button, and then sets it in front of her. Uh, and then we change the name. So we're taking extra lengths to make sure those folks stay connected. But the tactical piece, create one link that folks can use so that they don't have to register. Um, and, and, and then if the phone, like I just don't think phone on Zoom is as, as good, but um, if that's what all they can do or have technology for or internet speed, then that's fine too. But I found that that one link is the best and easiest way to kind of skip over all the other stuff. All right, Cindy, I can do one more, I think. Okay, well, we have uh, one more hand raised. So, Eric, I'll ask you to unmute yourself. Bruce, can you address the issue of putting our service either on Facebook Live or YouTube? One of the objections that's been raised is that everybody then who's at worship, because we do a Zoom worship, is on Facebook Live or YouTube, whichever one we go to. Um, so we're having a debate about how do we do that and get everybody's permission to yeah. be on YouTube. So we don't stream. We made the decision early on not to do it because there are too many complications. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's how we've addressed it. We don't do it because um, uh, I fully embrace the interactivity of Zoom that you cannot replicate on a streaming experience. And now with the changes that Zoom has made, so you can't, if you, if you spotlight multiple people on your Zoom meeting, that does not show up on your Facebook Live necessarily. There's, there's pieces that are not translating to your streaming. So it's, a, it's almost a different experience. So that's why we've driven, we, we only do Zoom. So I would say if you're streaming, be very careful about creating two totally different experiences. Because if you say, oh, I'm gonna spotlight so-and-so and so-and-so, but people are watching it on Facebook, they're not gonna see that. So mm -hmm. figuring, you know, again, it's kind of like real life, how do you create language that occupies multiple spaces? So, you know, acknowledging those, those idiosyncrasies around Facebook, you will get more views on Facebook. You're going to get more people watching, uh, but they won't have the same experience on Zoom. So we just made the choice not to stream. So um, uh, and 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 I also don't trust Facebook enough to always let them have my stream. In terms of uh, it's it it breaks a lot. The handoff is not always consistent. And our church was thinking about going off of Facebook anyway. We have there's there's other issues around Facebook that that the pandemic has helped them force us to all back on a little bit more. Um, so that's more, that's a whole nother webinar. Um, so I would say create space that honors both of them and limit the Zoom features that aren't gonna show up on Facebook. So, so you're not kind of uh, creating a, a better space and a lesser space. I don't know if that's helpful, but um, again, we don't, we don't stream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Thank you. All right, thank you, you all. Thank so you. thank you for having me. The, so I'm going to confess, I was supposed to be with you on for another half an hour. And then I realized that I, I overlap booked because I'm overextended and uh, was not paying attention to a shift. And so I'm like, I'm really, really, really apologize for not being able to be with you for the full two hours. But um, I'm zipping off to, to, to be in a webinar now. So but Appreciate I'm you all. Stay on. So if people want to keep asking questions sure. or having conversation, you know, we can stay on for the next half hour and do that. Awesome. So Bruce and, and Godspeed. Feel free to thank you. Feel free to contact me on Twitter, or Facebook, any of those other places, and I try to interact. Oh, I will make a plug for we do have the Zoom Faith group on Facebook. 
Um, it, it started right as this go and we meet every other Monday on a gathering on Zoom to talk about things that are going on. That Zoom faith group uh, has 2,600 members in it now. And it, I don't know how that happened. Uh, all the expertise you would ever need about Zoom, uh, there are people there to help out and, and engage in that. So I invite you to, all you have to do is put Zoom faith on Facebook and you'll find it. Zoom Peace. faith on Facebook. All right. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you all. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, folks. Uh, it is, um, we, we have time to continue the conversation if you would like. Um, I know it's also been a lot of information and the chat in the chat has been good, but now I'm seeing some hands. So Mia, I'm gonna invite you to unmute yourself. Hi. Hey. You can hear me? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I, I clearly need some foundational teaching because I, I just, I don't really understand what is the difference between using Zoom to broadcast your service to a remote congregation and streaming on Facebook. Um, yeah, so Zoom is, is an enclosed gathering. Um, so right now, uh, no one outside of this room is seeing what's going on. You have to be inside this meeting to, to see it, to hear it, to participate in it. What I tried to do at the beginning, which didn't work, as Bruce said, sometimes there are glitches, was then take what we were doing here and stream it to Facebook. Uh, so it would be visible on Facebook to people who wanted to watch, but who didn't enter the room. Some people don't use Zoom. They simply do Facebook Live or YouTube Live. So they don't come into a Zoom room. And this is part of what Bedford's doing. They use a, a recording device, a camera, um, a phone, whatever the device is, and they take what is happening in person straight streaming to Facebook or YouTube without having the Zoom room experience. That's the basic layperson edition. Um, yeah. Tia, I, I, I'm gonna go ahead and a couple more hands up. Tia, we haven't heard from you, so ask you to, there you go. There we are. Um, I, I, we've talked a lot about tech um, and I know that even that sounds overwhelming, but, but as much as we talked about tech, um, as much it is the pushback and I'm sure that I'm not the only one around that, that all people want to do is go back to the way things were. And right in the very beginning, Bruce said something about make sure um, that you don't fall into like, we just want to go back because this is going to be, and I completely realize that, but I sometimes wonder how do we translate that in an effective way into our own faith communities with, you know, yeah, I'm the pastor and probably should be able, but I mean, some pointers and stuff is probably a helpful. And I'm, I think I'm not the only person struggling with how do you bring that to a community to realize that if they don't take that step when the opportunity is right 10 years from now there's going to be nothing rather than something right um so um just that translation how how do you engage in that pushback that it will not be forever anymore yeah if yeah. anyone has any suggestions i mean that would be really helpful and that's, I mean, that is part of our larger challenge. Um, and honestly, some churches won't care. I mean, bluntly and honestly, some, some sessions won't be interested uh, because the focus is so immediate that thinking towards the future possibilities is not a conversation they're interested in having. Um, 
I suspect that there are people uh, gathered here today that would love to be part of a small group talking that out. And if you are, if you want to be part of a continuing conversation about talking about this adaptive change as well as the technical change, all the technical stuff <laughs> that Bruce talked about, um, go ahead and put your, your names and emails in the chat. I'm gonna save the chat. In fact, I'm going to see if I can let all of you save the chat. I don't let's look at that in a minute. Um, and, and that can be a, a group that forms and starts to work on this together. Yeah. All right. Um, Sarah, Sarah Hathaway. Yeah, I just wanted to um, clarify my question earlier because um, I didn't want it to sound like I was saying elder congregants couldn't learn anything new. Um, that's, I just want, I just want people to, to know that I was not sliding our elder congregation in any way. And um, yeah, just want to apologize if it was heard that way. And honestly, Sarah, I've, I've had as much trouble helping younger people navigate some of the technology. It's, it's not age, it's, it's some of our capacity to learn something new. Definitely. Carla. Yes, thank you. I have, um, Bruce said that, um, Esri, I believe, um, Eric, that they don't stream on YouTube because of having to get permission of people or liability or whatever you call that. But when we do the Zoom like here and you, you are recording it, and then everybody will see it. We will, all of us will be exposed to it. And which that is, why, is also. Yeah, which is why so, I said very, you know, at the beginning, this will be recorded. Um, that's right. So it, it, it is the same way. If we do, if we live stream, we have to announce uh, we are doing it live. Let us know if you cannot be and then sit on that corner. That corner is the corner of the non-stream people. Um, but yeah, so I was just gonna ask if um, this is the same and you just answered me. I was like, yeah, some people- And, and some of the sensitivity name, around, yeah, some of the sensitivity around worship tends to be, especially in congregations that share joys and concerns and share personal information. Um, most of the time in a webinar uh, or a tutorial, we're not sharing those kinds of personal details. Most of the time, sometimes it happens anyway. But those kinds of issues are things that we do also have to think about as we think about what worship and gathering can be that has a digital component and an in-person component, those kinds of sensitivities. Kingsley, I See you. I was just about to answer some of those questions that um, uh, I think some folks have uh, uh, regarding the, the, the streaming and uh, and the elderly being able to do the tech. For the streaming, first of all, for the streaming, the reason why it's hard to do, difficult to do the streaming, uh, streaming on YouTube and uh, Facebook is because you have a lack in the videos. Like if you're doing a live stream on the videos, first thing first, we might be saying something here. It takes about like two, three seconds before the person on Facebook can understand what you're saying. Let's say if you were doing a communion service and you already said something like, say, okay, now each of you all, before the time the people on Facebook are each of you all, you guys probably be in a drinking. So that's what I'm trying to say is there's uh, a slack in the video. And then also for the streaming tool on YouTube, it's a little bit complicated because you have to go through a level of securities and stuff like that mm -hmm. to get it done. And not everybody wants to see, uh, you know, not everybody wants a background out there, even though there's now we can have like uh, blurry backgrounds and stuff like that. Not everybody wants an image out there recording in, in, to everybody. And for the other ones regarding the the, the elders, I'm uh, uh, being able not to use some of the technologies. It's pretty easy. As I'm, uh, 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 what's his name again? Brad, I forgot, he just left. I can't remember. Sure. But as he said earlier, you can, yeah, bro, sorry. As you said earlier, you guys, can, you can always reach out to somebody in the technology group. I'm part of, for my own church, I'm part of the technology group in my church. So we have other folks too, which when they have issues using the technology, they can always reach out to us. 
and we will more than welcome to help you guys out. It's just, I can talk you through some of the stuff that I know because I do it every day at my job. So I can walk you through doing some stuff without even being there in, in person. If I don't know something, I can always do like a short research on it and tell you exactly, this is what you have to do. Press here, click here, do this, and that's gonna work. Just like that. It's just a basic training. It's never, it never hurts to like ask question out. If you face some difficulties, if you can't find something on your screen, just ask. I will be able to like tell you like, oh, swipe up or swipe down. I know yes, you guys were not there when we have technologies and technology keeps evolving every day. So that's just the issue. It's pretty easy. You can always reach out to us. We will be more than welcome to help you out. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you. No, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, and, and think creatively, um, especially now as so much of what we do doesn't require in-person uh, access. Think creatively about people who are connected to your congregation, maybe uh, the grandkids of some of your members would be willing to volunteer and help with tech. They may never have been to the church. They may not be honestly interested in going to church, but they might be willing to help and maybe, maybe that'll be an evangelism tool. So think beyond the, the people who are already in the circle to who they're connected with, who might then be able to help enrich the worship experience and the gathering experience for you. Lots of emails. So we're gonna have a good group of people to continue this conversation. All right, so before we break up, because I, I, I know there's always, there's more to talk about, more questions, but I wanna make sure you all know about upcoming events. Boom, 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 upcoming events. Um, so on Wednesday, October 28th, two weeks from now, I better open my calendar so I get all this right. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna tell you something and then somebody's gonna say, what? All right, Wednesday, October 28th, 1 p.m., so same time. Um, I'm gonna open a, a Zoom room for Advent and Christmas conversations talk about ideas, talk about resources. Again, perhaps find ways to collaborate, to have churches work together for home advent kits or whatever. I am not coming with a lot of answers. I'm coming to provide a space for conversation. So that's two weeks from today um, at 1 p.m. On Thursday, October 29th at 7 p.m., uh, yes, and the plan will be to record these things as well, because I know these times, they are what they are. There's no such thing as a perfect time. Thursday, October 29th, 7 p.m., uh, the music director of the Clinton Presbyterian Church is going to lead a digital choir tutorial. Um, she's going to walk through how to use two different programs with both of which have a free version uh, in order to create a digital choir. As uh, actually was this morning, someone in a meeting I was in this morning said, the worst thing on Zoom is trying to sing. You've ever tried it? You know, uh, you, you, can't, you can't sing all together on Zoom, but there is a way to create um, choral music together with these programs. So that's Thursday, October 29th at 7 p.m. And, and these are all on Zoom. Um, in November, uh, November 7th and 14th, we'll be hosting another moderator of the Presbyterian Church, the Reverend Denise Anderson. And she is going to lead us in two gatherings to help us build stamina for anti-racism work. And that's part of our Matthew 25 commitment. So that will be two Saturdays, November 7th, November 14th, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. both times. Again, they'll be recorded. If you can only make one, that's okay. They, they'll meant to complement each other. But if you can only make one and take one in, that's fine. And then the last upcoming event that I just scheduled yesterday, 
which I'll need after all these other things if you don't. Um, on Wednesday, November 18th, we are going to bring in a team from Presbyterian Disaster Assistance for a three hour retreat for resilience and renewal. So that'll start at 1.30 p.m. So again, a similar time slot. And that, that will really be about how are we caring for ourselves for the long haul? How are we caring for ourselves while we are in front of screens all day long? What are the things we can do to foster within ourselves resilience and renewal? All of these things go out in our e-connections uh, if you do not receive the, the e-connections for either Boston or Presbytery of Northern New England, uh, this is how you find it. Actually, I'm just going to, I'm going to really quickly put the link for both in the chat. Um, so for Boston. Here is the link to get the Boston. Oh, sorry. I, I copied the link before it was done loading. Here is the link to get the Presbytery of Boston e connections. And, bum, bum, bum. Here's the link to get the Presbytery of Northern New England e-connections. They are essentially the same with some differences based on uh, the different kinds of Presbytery specific gatherings and activities. So November 28th or October 28th, Advent and Christmas brainstorming session, November 29th, digital choir tutorial, November 7th and 14th, building stamina for anti-racism work, and then November 18th, Resilience and Renewal. And I'll get those all on the calendars too, which I haven't done yet, sorry. All right, folks, thank you. Thank you for tuning in today. Um, the video should be up and ready to go a little later this afternoon and and the link will go in tomorrow's e-connection. I'll try to pull the URLs that were shared, like Alter Live and FPC, uh, First Presbyterian Church Palo Alto. I'll pull those things and try to include that in the e-connection as well, as well as following up with those who want to be part of an ongoing conversation. Whew. Whew. I don't know about you. I'm going to take a deep breath. Thank you. Thank you for everything you are doing to connect with people in the name of Jesus. I know how crazy it is, how overwhelming it can be, but every little thing we do makes a difference. So thank you. I look forward to seeing some more of you uh, as we continue to gather here in this sacred Zoom space. <laughs> and uh, God bless you. God bless you as you continue to see how and where the spirit is moving. All right, stop recording.